Welcome, AP Biology students, to Unit 7, Lecture Topics 10 and 11. This is going to be note pages 64 through 71 in your notes packet. Uh, these topics are looking at speciation and extinction. Ultimately, what is speciation? Um, first, we need to look at, well, what is a species? And a species is a group of organisms that are so closely related that they're able to interbreed. And the key thing here is to produce viable, fertile offspring. So that means that those offspring that are produced are fertile and able to produce offspring themselves. Um, if they can't do that, then they're not really a true species by the sense of biology. So speciation is when you take a species and from that species, you form a new species. I feel like I'm saying the word species a lot because I am. So ultimately, speciation results in diversity of life forms. And when we talk about speciation, we need to take a look at, at, at two modes of speciation. So ultimately, geography does have an impact on speciation. And when we talk about geography, we're looking at um, uh, land features and, and where the organisms live among those land features. So there are two modes of speciation. The first mode of speciation is what we call allopatric speciation. And the second type is called sympatric speciation. Let's take a look at each. So taking a look at allopatric versus sympatric speciation. In allopatric speciation, there's a physical barrier that divides. Here's where we see geography. So there's a physical barrier that's going to divide population or a small population becomes separated from the main population. Ultimately, the populations geographically are isolated. And in doing such, it's going to prevent gene flow and it often is caused by natural disasters. Now, sympatric speciation, on the other hand, is when you have a new species that evolves while still inhabiting the same geographic region as the ancestral species. And this usually takes place due to the exploitation of a new niche, so a new type of behavior or role that that particular organism might play within that same geographic region or habitat. So if you look, here's an example um, of, of the two types of speciation. Here we have the original population in green. Here we have the initial steps of speciation uh, process. So here we get a barrier that's formed. And ultimately, evolution of reproductive isolation. We now have speciation taking place here. We have new distinct species um, that have reached equilibrium. So we have two different populations there that can no longer interbreed. Um, over here in St. Patrick, here you can see the, the original population. And right here you can see that, that group, a small group or population of species that now have a different role within that same geographical region or habitat that they are inhabiting. And ultimately they now start to interbreed but can no longer interbreed with the ancestral population. So you get um, uh, polymorphism will occur there within the population as, as the, that new population ultimately uh, starts to grow or increase. So speciation occurs due to reproductive isolation. And there are two types. There's pre-zygotic barriers and post-zygotic barriers. And ultimately, both types maintain isolation and prevent gene flow between the, the populations. Let's take a look at some examples. So if we look at pre-zygotic barriers first, pre-zygotic barriers prevent mating or are going to hinder fertilization. And uh, ultimately, there are five types of pre-zygotic barriers. Um, and we'll look at examples of each of each of these. So the first one is habitat isolation. Then we have temporal isolation. Um, temporal is going to refer to whenever you see that word temporal, 
that's going to refer to time. Um, behavioral isolation, mechanical isolation, and lastly, gametic isolation. So let's look at each, each example. Prezygotic barriers, habitat isolation first. Species live in different areas or they occupy different habitats within the same area. That is habitat isolation. So an example here in, in Western North America, the mountain bluebird lives at high elevations while the Eastern bluebird is going to live at a lower elevation. So here we have species that live in different areas or they occupy different habitats within the same area. So in the same area, we have one occupying at a higher elevation and the other one occupying uh, uh, the, the, the region at a lower elevation there. Another example would be temporal. Remember, temporal isolation is when the species breed at different times of the day, year, or season. So when we think temporal, you need to think of, of all all time references, whether it be a day, a year, or even a season, um, winter, summer, fall, or spring. So example, the western spotted skunk meets in late summer, while the eastern spotted skunk meets in late winter. So there you can see that temporal isolation there as far as mating, and it's going to be uh, during, during a particular season of the year to which these organisms mate. Another example here, uh, one of my favorite, that's the blue-footed booby, and this is gonna be a behavioral isolation. And in behavioral isolation, we have uh, unique behavioral patterns and rituals that are gonna separate species. And an example is the blue-footed boobies will only mate after a courtship ritual. Um, one of my favorite things about birds is courtship behavior, and uh, really cool is that of the blue-footed booby. So I'm gonna quick pop out here and show a video of blue-footed boobies and their, their uh, ritual there. On the Galapagos Islands, blue-footed boobies are just starting their families. Blue-footed boobies also dance to form partnerships. Each movement mirrors the other. Like flamingos, they seem to fall for birds like themselves. Compatible. Booby means clown. Their big blue feet are an important part of the costume. Blue feet are important because the blue color is hard to make, especially if the birds are in poor condition. It's an honest indicator of good health. So, they show them off. Unlike flamingos, boobies continue their courtship displays even after nesting starts, as though they weren't quite sure of each other. And then, while their partners are away feeding, both sexes flirt with their neighbors. The truth is that boobies have a roving eye, and those blue feet tend to wander. About half have secret extramarital affairs. They come up to each other and display. And one thing leads to another. Occasionally the male comes back and sees the female with someone else. She quickly returns to his side. He doesn't react. They display as they always do, affirming their relationship. They never split up. Thank <laughs> you. 
It seems here the instinct to stay together to raise a family is stronger than any infidelity. Okay. Pretty cool. Alright, so let's go back here. Next would be mechanical isolation. And in mechanical isolation, you're going to have the reproductive anatomy of one species does not fit with the anatomy of another species. An example, snails can have varying spirals on shells, which uh, ultimately can prevent mating. And then lastly, uh, gametic isolation. Um, here we have examples like proteins on the surface of gametes do not allow for the egg and the sperm to fuse. Um, an example here, the sperm and eggs of red and purple sea urchins are released in the water. Um, that would be known as broadcast spawning. Um, but they cannot fertilize each other um, because they, they do have this, this special protein coat or special surface on their gametes that will not allow um, the gametes from one species to mix with the gametes of another species and uh, have fertilization there. So, quick of you, take a couple of minutes to review the five types of prezygotic barriers with a partner or, or mentally with yourself. And read each example to determine which type of prezygotic barriers at work here. So, first one, many plants have anatomical structures that only allow certain pollinators to collect and distribute pollen. Pause and then think about it and then hit play to hear the answer as always. So, let's look. The answer would be mechanical isolation. Number two, Lions and tigers are both common in India, but the lions live in open grasslands while tigers live in the forest. The answer there, that would be habitat isolation. Number three, female fireflies identify male fireflies of their own species to mate with by their flashing patterns. A great example there of bioluminescence. The answer there, that would be a behavioral isolation. All right, postzygotic barriers. Postzygotic barriers prevent a hybrid zygote from developing into a viable fertile adult. And there are three types of postzygotic barriers. There's the reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and hybrid breakdown. Let's take a look at each. Reduced hybrid viability is the, uh, basically is when the genes of different parent species may interact in ways that impair the hybrid's development or survival. An example of this is domestic sheep can fertilize domestic goats, but the embryo hybrid, uh, the, the, but the hybrid embryo, embryo is gonna die early on. <clears throat> in reduced hybrid fertility, a hybrid can develop into a healthy adult, but ultimately it's going to be sterile. Um, this usually results due to differences in number of chromosomes between the parents. An example, a male donkey and a female horse can mate to produce a mule, but mules are sterile. So they are, they are not a, uh, able to reproduce and be fertile and have fertile offspring. In hybrid breakdown, the hybrid of the first generation may be fertile, but when they mate with a parent species or one another, their offspring will be sterile. An example of this, farmers have tried crossing different types of cotton plants, but after the first generation of plants, uh, they do not produce viable seeds to allow for the continuation. So take a couple minutes, let's do a quick review here. Work on practice FRQ in your packet. And lastly, let's uh, finish here with micro and macro evolution. So, closing in on micro macro evolution and a little bit with extinction. Speciation ultimately is the bridge between the concepts of microevolution and macro evolution. Microevolution is going to be a change in allele frequencies within a single species or population. And uh, ultimately, we see this with natural and sexual selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. In macroevolution, these are going to be large evolutionary patterns that are going to be uh, observed there. And it would be things like adaptive radiation and mass extinction. 
Uh, stasis means that there's no change over long periods of time. So the pace of speciation ultimately is, is basically evolution and speciation do occur at different speeds. Um, punctuated equilibrium, when evolution occurs rapidly after a long period of stasis, when there was nothing really changing. Um, gradualism is when evolution occurs slowly over hundreds, thousands, or millions of years. Um, ultimately, when we, when we think of, of evolution, it's, it's, it seems more of, a, of that gradual process that takes a lot of time. Um, we also have divergent evolution. Uh, divergent evolution is when groups of the same groups with the same common ancestor evolve and accumulate differences resulting in the formation of a new species. Um, adaptive radiation here is if a new habitat or niche becomes available, um, species can ultimately diversify rapidly um, because you have that new habitat or niche that's going to be a pressure there to cause uh, for a speciation uh, diversity. Um, convergent evolution is when you have two different species that develop similar traits despite having different ancestors. Um, those are what we're going to call analogous traits. And then lastly, extinction. Extinction is the termination of a species. So when species are alive, they are extant. But when they're gone, they're extinct. And extinctions have occurred throughout Earth's history. There have been five known mass extinctions throughout our, uh, Earth's history. Um, human activity has affected extinction rates. Anytime there is ecological stress, extinction rates can quicken. Ultimately, if a species does go extinct, it opens up a niche that can be exploited by a different species, and ultimately um, that could lead to an, uh, a new species or population of species over time. So thank you again for tuning into this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and continue to work on your topic review questions. We are almost near the end here. Have a great day.